What we're going to do for the next 10 minutes is have a, um, a fairly quick <coughs> overview about um, shoulder replacement surgery. And shoulder replacement surgery involves, there are two types, and I'm going to speak um, primarily about primary shoulder replacement, and Dr. Radazzi is going to talk about something else called reverse shoulder replacement. So we're going to talk about a little bit about anatomy. Um, my kids were so bored at home without the internet, they actually looked at my talk, <laughs> and they made me remove all the gory slides. So there's, there's only a couple um, that are uh, anatomic. Uh, how we do it, what can happen um, when things do occasionally go wrong, and um, we'll leave time for questions, hopefully. So those two images um, are images of a reverse shoulder replacement and a primary shoulder replacement. And here you see it again um, on your left is the reverse shoulder replacement where the ball and socket are actually switched around in their positions and on the right is a diagram of a primary shoulder replacement which is modular in that there's different size heads stems uh, and sockets that we implant so a little bit about shoulder anatomy um, the problem um, involves bone and both the humeral head and the socket which is known as the glenoid are normally covered by cartilage, articular cartilage. And the most common type of arthritis is osteoarthritis, where patients lose cartilage. When they lose cartilage, um, the joint starts to become symptomatic and it hurts. And um, this is what we call arthritis. So here's one or a couple of these slides that I told you about. So the anatomy of the shoulder, a couple of main things to understand. Um, we have the deltoid muscle and the pectoralis muscle. And when we do these surgeries, we go through an interval, which um, you should be able to see, between uh, the two muscles right here known as the deltopectoral interval. And that allows us access to the deeper part of the shoulder. And you're looking at um, a right shoulder over here, and the muscle in the front is the subscapularis, which we have to go through to get to the joint. And these are the other rotator cuff muscles in the back, and I think Dr. Badazzi will talk a little bit more about the rotator cuff. So, patients with arthritis have typically abnormal x-rays, and that's the first thing um, we'll get in the office. And you can see that normally there's a, a reasonable space between the ball and the socket, or the humeral head and the glenoid. But when someone develops arthritis and they lose cartilage, the space narrows, and you, patients form spurs in reaction to the increased stress on the bone because there's no more buffer. So that's a typical x-ray of osteoarthritis of the shoulder. Symptoms um, are pretty typical of arthritis in any joint. Um, it hurts when you move it. It also, uh, in the shoulder particularly, pain is, is typically worse at night when patients lie down. And when it gets bad enough, it just hurts all the time. So you see a picture here of a normal appearing humeral head with normal cartilage as opposed to an arthritic humeral head, which has lost cartilage, and it becomes sort of excavated and pitted and um, a source of significant pain. And when you examine these patients, often the muscles have atrophied because they can't use it normally. There may be swelling. There's typically tenderness at the joint line. And people complain of this catching, snapping phenomenon, which has to do with the abnormal surfaces, and they start to lose range of motion. How do we treat it? Um, Initially, we'll try you know, the standard things where we will have them you know, stop um, their um, paddle tennis or overhead sports or weightlifting in the gym. We will often use physical therapy to help reestablish range of motion. Physical therapy for arthritis is a little bit of a double-edged sword because um, you can easily flare the joint. So the therapist has to go very gradually and just try and get range of motion back without overstressing the joint, otherwise patients feel worse. Anti-inflammatory medications are definitely helpful, particularly for earlier on, and then we can go to injections uh, of a steroid, which is just another anti-inflammatory medication, and eventually, if it gets bad enough, we move into surgical options. And within the surgical options, there are the less invasive arthroscopic type procedures where basically we can clean up the joint, we call it a debridement, we can sort of smooth the cartilage, we call that a chondroplasty. We can remove any loose pieces because the cartilage tends to fragment, fragment and become loose in the joint. And if the joint is very stiff, we can release some of the um, contracted tissues, which is called the capsule, 
and that will improve their range of motion. And that can be helpful for patients with mild to moderate arthritis. When arthritis becomes severe, we move into the replacement options. And within replacements, we have something called hemiarthroplasty, where we just replace the ball, which we don't do that often anymore. Uh, and the total shoulder replacements, we have the two types. So the, the hemiarthroplasty we will do um, occasionally for patients who are younger and we don't want to put in a, a plastic socket. If the socket itself is not too involved, we can sometimes get away with just replacing the ball. If the socket is badly worn, there's not enough bone, then we will actually obviously not put a socket in and just put in the ball. There are some surgeons who aren't really comfortable with putting in sockets, so they do hemiarthroplasties more frequently. And before the era of reverse replacement, we would do a hemi or hemiarthroplasty <coughs> for patients who had a bad rotator cuff tear, but now we have the reverse replacement. So the whole concept of total shoulder replacement, I think, is um, really critically um, related to this man. This is Charlie Neer. And uh, Dr. Neer um, was a Columbia Presbyterian, and I was fortunate to be his second to last fellow in 1989, and where I really learned a tremendous amount about shoulder replacement and shoulder surgery uh, in general. And the concepts, because he was really the pioneer of this operation, was to preserve the anatomy, to take out as little bone as possible, that there were no mechanical stops, because if we had mechanical stops, the joint would tend to loosen. And that the actual replacement was a fulcrum really for the muscle rehabilitation. And the muscles, particularly in the shoulder, are really critical in shoulder function. And he was, he was emphasized this time and time again, that if you just do the replacement and don't work on the muscles and you don't balance the muscles properly, it's not gonna work. So um, the reasons that I mentioned that we do the operation Osteoarthritis is clearly the most common. And as you can see in that graph, the incidence of osteoarthritis early in all the major joints clearly increase with age. There are other types of arthritis, inflammatory or rheumatoid arthritis, um, arthritis of dislocations in patients who've had recurrent dislocations of their shoulders, people who've had fractures, post-traumatic arthritis, or chronic severe rotator cuff tears. These can all um, lead to degeneration of the joint and need for replacement. So, here's how we do it, seven easy steps, um, and no blood. Um, we will make an initial removal of the degenerated or arthritic head. We then prepare the canal, um, and we prepare the socket, and we will insert um, stem into the canal, and we typically don't cement these very often anymore. We tend to do what we call press fit, and the prosthesis is coated with the material so the bone will grow into it. And the socket side, we will still um, glue most of the time into the socket. And then we have different size heads um, that will fit each patient. And there you have shoulder replacement. That's about how long it takes to do the operation. <laughs> um, so x-rays, so top x-ray, arthritic joint, really minimal space left between the ball and socket, post-operative x-ray, new ball, the stem is inside the bone, and a new socket, which is difficult to see, but there's a little metal marker in the socket. And there are different shapes of sockets, there's different ways, uh, different designs, some have pegs, some have keels, um, but they're all kind of variations on a theme. So the, um, the operation, if we can get this to play, okay, there we go. So there's really two planes of motion in the shoulder. There's the scapular moving, along the, the back, and then the actual ball and socket moving at the joint. And most people after the surgery do get you know, excellent range of motion with uh, significant pain relief. So summarize, new joint surfaces, excellent range of motion and function. Most patients return to um, non sort of stressful sports like swimming, golf, tennis. They should all be able to do that. They do wear a sling for about a month and they do physical therapy for two to three months. In terms of longevity, we do have studies out um, actually over 20 years now, and 87% of these are working fine at 20 years. So it has an excellent, what we call survivorship. Complication rates are low, but they're not zero, and they include things like infection, prosthesis getting loose, uh, rotator cuffs can tear because we don't, we don't replace the rotator cuff, and people occasionally will fall down and, um, and break things. 
But most commonly, and this is what Frank uh, mentioned earlier, the most common thing I hear is this. And people feel, I hear this all the time, that people say they should have done the operation sooner because it really is uh, quite miraculous in how they feel and relief of pain. And the relief of pain is quite rapid. Within a couple of weeks after the surgery, uh, patients are already you know, sleeping well and, and feeling pretty good. So thanks for your attention.